Yeah, we're coming to you live from the Restaurant 365 Studios in Boston, Massachusetts with the Transformation Tour 2024, our 365 Restaurant Transformational Tour live with the Hospitality Hangout. We've got our host, Jimmy Frischling, the finance guy, and I'm Shatsy, the restaurant guy. Jimbo, we got a great show. Let's take it away. I think you're well caffeinated for the flight. You're definitely up. Oh, right? I'm ready, baby. You got everything to get me going, baby. The music, the upbeat, the caffeine, a great lineup, and super excited to be here at the R365 Restaurant Transformation Tour 2024. I will officially welcome you uh, and, and thank you for joining us on the Hospitality Hangout, a hospitality focused podcast where the founders at Branded share their insights and bring incredible technology and innovation leaders that are making things happen in the industry we love. My name is Jimmy Frischling, otherwise known as the finance guy. I'd introduce my partner, Mr. Michael Schatzberg, also known as the restaurant guy. Oh, and thanks for that kind introduction, Jimmy. And for all those listening, feel free to call me Shatsy. And together, we are the personalities behind branded hospitality ventures. We work at the intersection of hospitality, technology, innovation, and capital. And today, as Jimmy said, we are coming to you live from Beantown, Boston. Jimbo, we haven't seen much of the town yet, but from what I see so far from the airport over to the hotel, nice. Very, very nice trip. I opened up my, my uh, hotel. I opened up the uh, the curtains. Beautiful view of the parking lot. Beautiful view of the parking lot. <laughs> I, got that. I think I got upgraded there. But I got to tell you, Jimbo, before we jump into it, because we got a lot to get to, we got a lot of guests. I, I just want to talk to you about something that's really important to me keeps me up at night all the time. It's restaurant accounting, finance, it's payables, receivables, all that stuff. Restaurant operators, as you know, Jimbo, you know, because you were a bartender, you've worked in restaurants for a long time. Uh, I've been in restaurants for a long time. And you know, I, we're good at a lot of things. We're not great at bookkeeping. It's just something we're not good at. We're good at like hospitality, uh, making great food, you know, making beautiful looking restaurants, right? But when it comes to bookkeeping, it just sounds like it's something we're not really good at. So I got to tell you, having a system like Restaurant 365 out there, it's awesome because it really, it really changed the game for restaurant operators and lets them focus on what we do. And what do we do? Great food, great, great experiences. Yeah. Welcome, welcome our guests. Yeah, right exactly. Down. You know, so they're doing accounting, right? They integrate, they automate, they make it easy. You could, if you have, by the way, it's not just like, it's, you know, like it's not a system for one restaurant. It's a system of one, two, three, four, five, five hundred. I'm sorry, going to count. Okay, stop. Good. You jumped the five. Five thousand? Sure. It could go everywhere. They do workforce. They do payables, receivables. They have payroll. They do payroll, onboarding, uh, store operations. And I got to tell you something. We've been a customer for a long time, Jimmy. You know that. You know that. We go way back with them. I think we started before they were in business. Yes, we're not just hosting the podcast at their uh, tour. We're also customers. Yeah, and I got to tell you, you know what? They actually help you make money. They help you make money. You know, I've said on the podcast often, um, and I'm not a golfer in chats, you can attest to that, as can anyone who's played with me. Um, but I do understand the sport. And the, the expression of my I played to be hard. Yeah, I know. I'm good on the 19th hole. Um, maybe the turn. Um, but the, um, you know, the driving, the drive is for show, and the putt or the putting is for dough. And to and I talk a lot about front of house being the driving range, and it's critically important. Um, and that's what the guest sees. But really, money is made and lost, and really this of restaurants happens in the back of house. And again, I think R365, while they're known for so many things, on the, certainly on the accounting side, you know, their, their ability to boost profits with data-driven inventory and labor and scheduling into, you know, uh, actually- Did you just made, make that up or did you read that off your uh, no, cue card? No, I absolutely read it off the cue card. No, <laughs> I, uh, no I'm telling you, <laughs> data-driven inventory. Yeah, you come up with that Actionable one. data. <laughs> you know, look, I come from the financial markets. I come from a world that, uh, again, I love that I've married, um, uh, my, my financial uh, investment uh, kind of uh, hopefully prowess and, and passion with hospitality. And data is something that I think the industry has in the hospitality industry continues to, let's say, not value as much as I think it should. And I argue that um, hospitality data, uh, which is really consumer preference data, is the third most valuable data set that exists. Um, and, and I think companies like R365 that we should make it actionable and to and ultimately let Intel 
you know, don't don't just give me raw data, actually make it usable, actionable. I think that's one of the things that R365 is doing right now in a very meaningful way for their clients, for their customers. I think we've said R365 enough. I mean, we've got a great guest sitting here. What do you think, Jimbo? All right, let's can, we, can, we, can, we, can we bring in our first guest? Yes. Because it's a monster. It's All a monster. Right, you, you, you bring the intro in. All right. Look, I'm super excited. I absolutely uh, love the, the, the brand um, and have a I'm super excited. Be, it's, it's, uh, it's very good that we have a uh, that we have a guy like this up in Boston because I feel like uh, you know. Look, I got to tell you, if we're at an R three sixty five show, a back of house and accounting, and really about dated numbers, we should kick it off with Steve, Mister Steve Song, CFO Luke's Lobster. How about that? How about starting off strong? Well, I mean, everybody in the audience seems to be really digging it. I mean, the guy, the guy's a rock star. The guy's a rock star. But it is, you know, Luke's Lobster it makes sense to be in Boomtown. I mean, you think about lobster. You think about you know Martha's Vineyard, uh, Boston. You think about that, don't you? Maine. Uh, Maine. Can I start with Maine. Well, you know, but I'm sure. And we got a lot to get into with Steve because he's a rock star. Okay. And Luke's lobster roll. I mean, we got a bunch of New York City. We love him, right? But before we get into it, let's get into Steve and learn more about Luke's lobster and what they're doing. Okay. Let's try and get to know Steve a little bit. Okay. Because let's just find out how did Steve Song become the CFO of Luke's lobster with over 5,000 restaurants worldwide? Steve, Steve, don't be mad. Steve graduated yeah. from yeah. Columbia yeah. University yeah. in 2001. Started a career. Jim, you'll appreciate it. I do appreciate it. He was an oh. analyst at J.P. Morgan, a little yeah. firm. I've heard of J.P. Morgan. He worked there for 10, 15 years, exhausted. He was exhausted from that. Long hours. He worked at eight o'clock in the morning. Very tiring. He got very, very tired. He got on the board of directors of Ford Models because he's like, you know what? I'm a banker. I need to meet models. <laughs> it went hand in hand. Models and banking go together like whatever. Well, am I right, Jimmy? Uh, I'm going to take issue as a former banker. A, we don't ever talk about the hours. It's just part of the. That's just what you do. It's part of the. You know, this world you talk of of bankers and models. That, that's that's not. That's that never know. happened. I, yeah, I, I, I sell model. Yes, exactly. Yeah, sell models. Exactly. Thank you. Steve. And then, and then, so he's, he's exhausted from banking. He's exhausted of all his models. And he says, I must be involved with lobster. Somehow, I don't know why, but lobster. And he joins Luke's Lobster eight years ago. And the rest is history, as they say. Steve, welcome to the show. No, oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. So, Steve, tell us about the transition from, uh, from the, let's say, not not unlike my own transition, although I'm, I'm still kind of, uh, I think, um, I play uh, the, in the hospitality space from the investment space. You went from banking um, to the CFO of Luke's Lobster. Tell us about that move for you. Oh, it's been great. I got an opportunity to join Luke's Lobster. I met with Luke Holden and Ben Connell, the founders. Um, we just really saw eye to eye, and I told them, I don't know anything about being the CFO. I don't know anything about restaurants or lobster, but I want to work with you. You guys want to open up a shoe store? Let's go. Because at the end of the day, it's all about people. Agreed. And I think hospitality is all about people at the end of the day. And by the way, Shazzy, that's the agility you get when a banker comes in to J.P. Morgan. I've never been a CFO before, but just tell me what to do, coach. Put me in. Let's go. Put me in. Well, yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah, shoe store, lobster store. I don't care what we're selling. Listen, so Steve, um, Shazzy makes fun of me all the time that, that I seem to have a less than love affair with New Jersey. That's really not true. Although it seems to play well on the show, but... What I can say is, on this show, I'm the native of New York, okay? And I remember, and I'm still living in New York, and that, that this is my hometown right now in Boston. But New York, I, I shouldn't have said that because the Bostonians might take issue with me. But listen, I remember when um, Luke, Luke's Lobster first opened up in the West Village, sorry, in the East Village in 2009. And there were lines around the corner, like New Yorkers have never seen a lobster. Um, but I think it really was. I mean, we never really had that kind of we stuff there. Kind of pizza role. and yeah, cheese but food, like lobster lobster role in, yeah. in, in, And being, you know, kind of positioned, sold, marketed in a way that was kind of like, kind of a cash, casual chic or chic casual. Like, something really cool about it. Um, and today, you guys are operating, first of all, the U.S. In, in, in 12 states, you have 22 stores. You also opened five stores in Japan, five stores in Singapore. So there's already a glo- you're a global brand. Can you share a little bit about you know from your perspective? You know since we are since we like to pride ourselves on being tech investors, share a little about how you're using automation to scale you know your processes across over thirty on a global scale 
and and essentially being mindful of headcount, of course. So I, there's a lot to unpack in that question, but you're now a global brand, over 30 stores. How are you guys leveraging tech um, and maybe addressing some of the, you know, the headcount issues that we're all facing? Yeah, Jimmy, that's a great point. I mean, the thing about restaurants is it's, it's really hard to scale without adding a lot of people. And in the service industry, you can have to do that. But in the back office, where I put my attention, you have to use technology. Back in the day when we first started, all the invoices would be mailed yes. to the corporate office, and we'd have an army of people punching those in. And I said, all right, if you want to get to 100 locations, 200 locations, I can't keep growing my head down in the corporate office. We'll just have to keep opening stores just to hire, just to pay for the person we're hiring in the back office. Mm -hmm. So we started leveraging technology. When I came on board, they already had Restaurant 365, but they were using it like just to pay the bills, just to do invoices, just to report sales. And I said, guys, you have a Ferrari here. We're driving it like a golf cart. So we need to take the time to actually learn how to drive this thing and make it useful. So now we have, you know, I'm proud to say we have two all stars on my accounting team. But we could triple our headcount or triple our store count and not hire any any other accounts. We give a shout out to these two all stars, or are you say no, you don't want anyone to know uh -huh. their name because someone could steal them. I, I tell them every day, like you're you're gonna get paid more somewhere else, but I give you a peace of mind where you have a great job. You got but no shout out on a podcast. So don't forget no, that. No, you know what I love, and I, I gotta tell you, I I already see, I see the quote, I see the quote that we're gonna be using for this this. This episode right now with Steve, it's they had a Ferrari in R365 and they were treating it like a golf cart. And you bring in, by the way, a banker. You bring in a, a sophisticated financial person. He sees the tool. He sees the need. And I got to tell you, that's the quote for R365. Freaking Ferrari, Steve called it. It's truly unbelievable. I mean, like I said, you, said, you guys are global now. We remember when you just had a couple of stores. I mean, uh, and I think we've also, when you guys opened, I just remember like, it was just the, the like you know it's just the triangulation was part of, like the timing is so important in so many things in life right you know and when you guys started with it, it was like lobster rolls were just kind of becoming like hot if, if that makes sense like and then then all over like it, like they became it just became a, like a thing everyone started having lobster rolls all over the place you know and and everyone truly loves them right and I think there's also like it, it feels like it's healthy. You know, it's like, ah, oh, it's a lobster, your little brother, a little bread. It tastes, you know, it's just delicious, you know what I mean? And everyone loves lobster. Anyway, but listen, you got stores, you got four walls, you got all over the world. You got, that. what did Jimmy say, 350 stores now? We're, we're just, we're just, we're just over 30, 30, even number 3,500 stores. And, and now you're going to the consumer, right? Love this. So you're doing direct to consumer, ready to eat, on the shelves, you're in freezers now. You're having lobster roll kits. People can make their own lobster rolls at home. Uh, I mean, Home delivery. I mean, it's just unbelievable all these different areas that we're doing. Tell us about this. How you started going from from the, the, the four walls and the brick and mortar to direct to consumer. And how was that going? How did you get that rolling? And what kind of challenges did you face? And talk a little about that. Yeah. So we have our brick and mortar locations, but there are only so many of them. Mm -hmm. 3,500. Um, 3,500. And the funny thing about lobster rolls. <laughs> Is I got Steve believing at 35 years old now. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, holy, that was shit. holy yeah, shit, I'm not getting paid enough. <laughs> <laughs> so lobster rolls are made to get rid of the claw up meat. That's, that's the well, original genesis of what a lobster roll is. Because nobody wanted the claw knuckles, they just wanted the tails. We have the so opposite sad. problem. We have the problem, opposite problem. We want the claw knuckle. We have tails as a byproduct. So we hired a great sales guy, Adam Wade, about seven eight years ago. He, got, he built a relationship with Whole Foods. So now we sold the tails to Whole Foods. They loved our tails. They said, you're the only, basically, the only supplier we want for lobster. So we, we're at Whole Foods with tails. Then they said, you have a great brand. We want to market you more. Come up with a CPT product on awesome. their freezers. So now we have 22 brick and mortar restaurants. We got Whole Foods, about 450 locations across the U.S. So if you don't live near one of our brick and mortars. At, at Whole Foods, are they marketing them under, like, are they loose lobster roll tails or is it loose Lobster tails, or is it just you know, like are you getting any recognition? No, not on the not on the glass, not behind the glass. Uh -huh. device. That's just tails. But just tails. Ask but them, big they, business, but you're not. Yeah, getting... but if you ask them, they said, "Oh, we get it from Luke's Lobster." Oh, that's awesome. Yep. And then in the freezer, we have Luke's Lobster branded CPG products mm -hmm. that they asked us to produce, and we started producing more and more. So if you can't come to the brick and mortar, go to Whole Foods. Then we said, if you can't go to the Whole Foods, how do we get food to you? So we started an e-commerce business called Luke's Online Market. Now we could ship anywhere in the continental 48, so you get your fix anywhere in the map. 
Unbelievable. Can I ask you a question? Why is it only the Continental 40? Why does Alaska and Hawaii always get left out? Why is that? What is, why, why can't we get them lobster off? I don't know how to explain geography to you, but yeah, you it's still, I mean, but I can't fly. Great rules of real estate. Okay. 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 You can't fly a plane up there. I mean, come on. So only people in the continent of the United States can get lobster. Well, I mean, I just think it's, I think it's discrimination. <laughs> distance. It's all about the distance. All right. All right. Okay. I'm just asking the question. I just want to, I just want to highlight it. We're going to move on with Steve, but uh, we're going to talk about what's next for him. But I, I just want to highlight or maybe uh, emphasize uh, what Steve was just talking about, the 400 store count in terms of uh, Whole Foods Whole and in terms of the, the CPG and in terms now of the Luke's uh, online delivery. The, the, if you think about there, there are 22 stores in the States, continental U.S., um, and now you think about what they're doing off-prem. They've expanded their their walls essentially exponentially and almost I don't say limitlessly, and that I think is so interesting to me as I think about brands that are so well known. And then you think respectfully, you got twenty something stores, and yet you're known. And when people think of lobsters and lobster rolls in the states, you're I think you're the leading brand and and purveyor, and and you do that in part because you've married a great off prem and CPG, and now with Whole Foods to basically expand the recognition of your brick and water. And I think that, I find that to be really what is incredibly clever, uh, for lack of a better word, about what you guys are doing. But for Luke's Lobster, after all of this now, what are you doing next? What's next for Luke's Lobster? He's going to start shipping to Hawaii and Alaska. Look at that. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's going further than that. I think, <laughs> it's going to be, I think the distance is going to be further. I mean, he's got stores in Singapore and Japan. He can't, he can't ship a lobster roll to, to, to Hawaii. So he's really offended by you leaving Hawaii. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, that's, that's those people over there. I mean, yeah. they just have a lobster roll. I mean, they live in Hawaii. Yeah. Doing yeah. Fine. Yeah. All right, Jimmy. All right. All right. <laughs> no, but I think globally is where we have our applications at. And, you know, the more partners we can find who want to open up in locations, um, get it all across the world. I always joke around, but it's true. There's only two truly American foods: Maine lobster and Texas barbecue. Boom! Good I like that. We, we got to we got to get our part to get across the world. I don't have I don't have a comeback for the Maine lobster part, but I, I do like in 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 the Northeast, specifically New York, where I'm from. Um, ba- uh, barbecue's matching barbecue chicken, uh, barbecue ribs, barbecue uh, brisket. Um, in Texas, it's a noun. We're having for dinner. Barbecue yep. means something completely different. I'm right. Texas barbecue. That's the meal. Yep. No, we, we have to say we have to say when barbecue whips. Yes, we have to. We have barbecue. Yeah, we describe it. Listen, yeah. I want to go into talking back. Uh, clearly, Shats and I uh, have a good time bantering. Uh, we also like to uh, have a little fun. Uh, but we learned along the way um, that sometimes our guests have a question for us. So uh, we created talking back. Uh, Steve, we're going to give you a chance to ask us a question or two. As I like to say, nothing's off the table. Steve, my friend, the microphone is yours. Well, over the past eight years, I've been in the books. I've been inundated with different tech companies that are coming and pitching at different point solutions, and all of a sudden, the point solutions are trying to be more expansive. Where, where do you see this all playing out? Consolidation or capital drying up? How, how does that all play out for restaurant operators that they've built a Frankenstein yep. portfolio of their tech stack? Right, right. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I mean, I think that, I mean, clearly you mentioned a few things. I think for all of the above, I think you're going to continue to see consolidation. Um, because operators are inundated with a lot of tech, but and, and, and things will consolidate. And you know, you, you really, bigger guys are saying, "Hey, you know, why would I build that? I can just buy this feature set and I'll make my product more sticky." You know, you've seen it throughout. You know, all of technology, and not just in restaurant technology. Just you know, in, in the Google and the Microsoft and the Apple's of the world, you know, they're buying buying up people or different companies. But I think uh, as you see that consolidation happening. I also see a, a, a very robust pipeline of new ideas and new technologies, new things that we haven't even thought about before that are coming through. You know, so as we absorb and, and the tech that we're getting, and it's, it's great, and we're using it, and, and I think there's still a really well, there's still a lot of white space because there's a low adoption rate. I mean, still a lot of tech. I mean, with three six five and. and with 40,000 plus customers. That is really small relative to a million restaurants in the United States, you know? So there's a lot of white space for them to just continue to grow with what they have and get their message out there. But what I'm excited about is also that there's also a whole, uh, you know, list of new things coming down the pipeline that uh, folks like yourself 
you know, there are operators out there who are always looking for the new things to, to go to prevent the past. You know, there's always great new innovation coming. I know Jimbo's got some really interesting insights on this all stuff. I, 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 I like, uh, I like that. And I'll simply, I'll, I'll try to keep mine. Um, you're the electronic uh, guy. I'm the finance guy. I'm going to keep mine a little more focused on that aspect. You start the podcast off by talking about why people go in the restaurant business and, and how it's a, it's a people business. It's a, it's a food and beverage business. It's experiential. It's very personal to our guests. We even we're the call them customers. We call them guests. We want them to have this experience with our food and beverage and our people. And now we're challenging them with all this tech. And I actually feel um, we've been an industry that has been antiquated and analog. And I still believe, despite what I'm about to say, that we're in the early innings of this digital transformation. That said, there's been an explosion of technologists pushing products and software and innovation onto the industry. And I dare say, from what I hear from operators, it's overwhelming. So to your point about you know fe- features and and point solutions, I think there needs to be, and there will be, a continued consolidation. I think best in suite will beat best in class because of the you know, reduced friction uh, on the operators. And then to, to Shati's point, as you bundle a number of these, we'll call it XYZ or core solutions um, on single platforms, it'll then create opportunities for what else is new, what things we haven't even thought about yet. But the idea that so many disparate, you said Frankenstein, the idea that Technologies, you know, a quick serve restaurant has between 20 and 30 ISVs, independent software vendors. Even full service restaurants have about 15. It's overwhelming. So, the consolidation and bundled solutions, integrated solutions, I think that's part of what R365 and others are doing. And then you can let the operators kind of test out those, we'll call it the new thing, but not not so much, not, not, not the having this Frankenstein. I, I think that's a great one. Yeah, no, it's a great point. Uh, Jimmy, great question. But listen, Right now, we got to jump into the next segment, and i got to tell you, we're super excited about the famous Food Service Feud Trivia Tuesday Edition. It's not Tuesday. Uh, we do Trivia Tuesday, but I do hear, I do hear this the second best segment on any podcast. Well, you second know the first one. It's uh, Joe, Joe Rogan has barely got a problem. Yeah, no, this is awesome. So we got the we got Food Service Feud. Okay, we're bringing it back. Here we go. It's uh, we asked over one hundred thousand people on LinkedIn through our um our Tuesday trip and our Tuesday trip and we got tremendous feedback, tremendous feedback. Um get your imaginary buzzer ready. I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? First one to ring in, you get to uh answer and you win great prizes, fabulous prizes and gifts and lots of valuable things here at the restaurant three sixty five transformational um uh, fabulous event here in Boston. Steve you ready? Jim are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. And I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to give you the answers, I think. I think I'm going to give you the answers so you can pick. Right? Or should I not well, give you the answers? Choice? Choice. I'm going to give you a 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 choice. All right. Okay. okay. All right. What fresh food can be kept fresh on lobster for over a year if kept cold enough? Pears, lemons, apples, or kiwi? Bing. Jimbo rings in really fast. Yeah, yeah. You know what? You didn't say limes, but as a bartender, I'm cutting up lots of lemons. I'm cutting up lots of limes. I'm flipping my fingers with these the the, 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 the limes I need to cut, cut, cut. So I'm going to go with the lemons. The idea. Uh, you know what? I got to tell you, Jimbo. Right. Yeah, that gets that big. Did I win? No, that means you lost. That's oh. a bad sound. That's, That's a bad sound. sound. You know what? I, I'm very excited. Steve, you can steal and win the fabulous prize that you now for. What do you think it is? All right, let me get let me get the I'll say lemons because Jimmy said that. All right. Making lemonade. What do you I think the choices were pears. Definitely not kiwi. Definitely not kiwi. Lemons, apples, or kiwi with the choice. Lemons probably got a dong sound of some kind. All right. Yeah, Jimmy, that, that, that's what Jimmy gets when he does it. When he makes a bad guess, he gets right. that. I'm, I'm going to go with apples here. I mean, Look at that. I mean, the guy, the guy's a rock star. He knows. He knows. Listen, when it comes to fruits and vegetables, a long shelf life, everybody knows, Jimmy. Apples are top of the list. Everybody knows that. Do you think they can last two to four months in your fridge? Store whole apples in your refrigerator in the crisper drawer away from vegetables. I guess it's like we're like Martha Stewart now. We're giving like little. Does that little, mean like pears are like a close second? Because our- Aren't they like kissing like cousins? cousins? Yeah. Isn't that like cousins? You know, I think so. But I, in my experience with pears, they get like brown spots very quick. 
You know, but I got to tell you, if you eat up fun industry facts as much as we do, you should check out the new release R365 2024 State of the Restaurant Industry Report. Do you know you can download the full report for my fun facts at restaurant365.com and click the resources tab. We'll also link it to the show notes. And by the way, Jimmy's got a lot of really great insight on various fruits and vegetables that he likes to eat. Yes, so check into that r365.restaurant365.com. Check it out. Click the picture, Jimmy. And, yes, uh, and, fruits I like. and you can actually connect with Jimmy live and you can ask Jimmy. So anyway, listen, we're jump right into the quick fire, right? Quick fire. All right, now it's quick fire. And, and Stephen has five lightning round questions. Are you ready? Yep, don't, yep. don't think too hard. Don't, you know, because we, we, we have another guest coming in, by the way. <laughs> All right. Favorite restaurant chain started in Boston. Is it Legal Seafoods, Uno Pizzeria Grill, Portucci's, or Papa Gino's? Uh, legal. Legal yeah, Seafoods. That's a layup. Yeah. Favorite TV show set in Boston. Is it Cheers, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Ally McBeal, or The Practice? Ooh. Well, I know Cheers is Boston. Yeah, I mean, this is your favorite. Oh, my favorite. It's your favorite. They're all from Boston. They're all Boston. Boston. They're all Boston. I love Melissa Joan Hart. She was my uh, crush growing up. So let's go to Sabrina Teenage Witch. All right. Yeah, I've never seen that show. I have I think I've heard of that show. Yeah. It's it, actually, it, it, like, really you like 70. Oh, is that? This show is a little young for you. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, Steve's like 28, so. All right. Favorite Boston-born celebrity. Is it Mr. Marky Mark Wahlberg? Uma Thurman? Ed Morton? Or Barbara Wawa, or or I got another or Colin O'Brien. Ooh, ooh, that's a good one. Barbara Wawa. <laughs> Let's go, with Conan. I like I like the smart. Go ahead, go ahead. All right, Red Sox, Celtics, and Bruins. Oof, I'm a Yankee fan, so I can't pick Red Sox. It's interesting. Yeah, the Patriots say, didn't get married. Well, weird, right? It's well, lobster. Is that like the official lobster roll of the Boston Red Sox? I'll go with. Boston Red that's Sox. fair. Yeah, that's I, I, I agree. That's I awesome. All right. If you were to challenge this work, things get a little a little dicey. If you were to challenge Jim or I to compete for the best time in the world famous Boston Marathon. The Boston <laughs> Marathon. Jimmy and I and you are all gonna run in that. Okay. <laughs> Who do you have better odds of beating in the Boston Marathon? Jimmy, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> But see, that's not it's 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 sneaky. Yeah, it is. It is because yeah. it's long. It's long. It's like right, it's, so like, it's, like, a, it's like a it's like it's like a marathon. Who I think I'd be it's like, <laughs> it's like a marathon. I mean, a marathon is like a, it's like a marathon. I mean, a boy, yeah, marathon, like, 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 that's a really like, like a marathon. Here. Like that's a really like a marathon. <laughs> so who could be you know, Jimmy? Be, 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 be. I think I'd be chatting. I think you'd sprint out ahead and then slow down and like, take a nap. I would agree. I would agree. I would lose interest in the marathon. Yeah. And I would definitely. Wasn't there some, I, I remember, Jimmy, wasn't there like a New York City marathon one time? Didn't someone like start the race and she like got off with the subway? Yes. And then she won? Yes, like Rose is coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yes. that's right. I, she, I feel yes. like I would do that. She jumped in. I would, get on, I would get on the T. I would get on the T yes. boss and I'd be like, yeah, where have you guys been, man? I'd be like, the whole line, the green line. Hold on the record. I respect your choice. First of all, I've actually run the New York City marathon, not the Boston marathon, but I've run the New York City marathon. Although, I was a little lighter back then, so uh, <laughs> I, at least I know. At least I've done it. I know. Like, I think I can see yeah, that. New York Marathon as well as the Boston Marathon. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> by, the way, by the way, can you ask me the same question about the uh, the, the, the Boston team, the Red Sox, the Celtics, the Bruins, and the Patriots? Can you ask me the same question. Give me the Patriots. Rangers. Rangers. <laughs> yeah, but I, I thought it was interesting that uh, our producer Joe Green included the Patriots. Oh, he's he's a Boston big giant fan. Well, he's like, that's new England. No, big Giants fan. Big Giants. I guess big so. Giants. I guess so. I will listen to it. I've got to let Steve go. He's got like more, uh, he's going to go ship some lobster tail to the Whole Foods. He's got a lot to do. This was great. I mean, having Steve's song here is awesome. We love Luke's Lobster. All looking forward to all the, to, to more to come, right? Yes. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Continue to accept, my friend. Thank you. Take care, boys. You're great. I got to be honest with Jim Bob. It is great to be here at the Restaurant 365 transformational uh, event. By the way, the RTT. The part, I like the RTT. Nobody does accurately. Look, I mean, look, 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 RTT, you're down with me? You don't read? RTT. RTT. I'm loving it. We're, we're in Boston, being town. By the way, great lunch. And what did we have, Jimbo? You didn't have it. You didn't have a chowder. You had the chowder? I had the chowder. You know what I had? Manhattan chowder. 
I had to <laughs> Yeah, come on, man. I know that the people at our table were very angry that I said I was a Jet fan and a Yankee fan. It's they not... cared about the Yankees. They laughed at you about the Jets. They're like, yeah, we don't worry about that. Yeah, well, it's easy to laugh about the Mets, the Jets and Mets, I guess, also. But anyway, listen, Jumbo, we, yeah, we, it, it's nonstop action here That's... at the RTT. It's nonstop in Boston. Restaurant 365, great event. And we always restaurant royalty. I don't think you knew this, Jumbo. We, we have restaurant royalty with us. From being down, it's Kathy Turner from Turner Seafood, a super famous, super famous restaurant. Uh, four locations, right, Kathy? Yes. Four locations. Uh, um, the whole family comes from a whole fishmonger family, you know. So it's really, I mean, it's near and dear to us because our first restaurant was a seafood restaurant. So we, you know, in New York uh, City, grab so we know it. So, Kathy, thanks so much for joining us. Before we dig in, and get to know Kathy Turner and all about Turner Seafood, everything going on there. We'd like to know how our guests became in, got into that position that they are today, running all these these Turner Seafoods that are super famous. So it's a, it's a multi generational business. So a little fact here: in 1920, 20 year old James F. Turner, he was just 20 years old, didn't know what he wanted to do. He, he, he immigrates here from St. John's, Newfoundland. Come over here. He, he took a boat. I think it was a boat. A very big boat. It was a single boat. Safe bet that it was a boat. But it was definitely a boat. It was a boat of some sort. And he begins his career on the Boston Fish Pier in the, in the early 1920s. Worked in art. He's putting time. He's putting down a G. It's unbelievable. And, he, and he's known on the pier as Big Jim. A leader in New England's seafood industry. My understanding is he came up with the idea for doing a clam chowder, but that's a story for another time. It was his idea. Somebody wanted to call it Boston clam chowder. He's like, no, it's no evening clam chowder. James Turner came up with that fact check. Okay. In 1954, Turner Fisheries opening, coupled with rapid expansion, commercial, uh, they, they start selling to commercial airlines. They're selling from, to, 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 to British Airways and, 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 and Delta and American Airlines, everybody buying their seafood. And it turned Toronto into a nationally recognized seafood conglomerate of quality. Toronto equals quality. 100 years, four generations later, I have the privilege of sitting here with Kathy. By the way, it's with an I. That's not real Y, it's an I. Very cool way of spelling it. It is spelled with an I, right? Okay, good. Uh, Kathy has continued the legacy that James F. Turner started. Not only are they selling great chowder, I don't even know if they're selling chowder. I couldn't make that up. But it's unbelievable. Fatty, I probably got some of that right. Great to have you here. Tell us about yourself. Well, nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. That was um, partially correct. I mean, <laughs> and he did take a boat, but the boat landed him in Bermuda. And he knew he was a born salesman, um, James F. Turner, when he sold his fur coat to a uh, um, Bermuda man on the beach. And yeah, uh, sell his fur coat to get to Boston because that's where he was supposed to be going. There you go, Jay. <laughs> I, I didn't have that little fun guy. I don't, I used to, I used to love selling fur coats to people and not a beach of Bermuda. Exactly. Oh, so he, Jim, I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> he was a blind salesman, lands in Boston, really didn't know what to do. Worked for the railroads actually for about a year. But because of his heritage, he really ended up on the fish pier. And fast forward a little bit, we didn't actually sell to the airlines. We ship through the airlines. So well, no, no, that's what I did. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, my fact checking is just, it's, you know, I do a bath job. Yeah, please don't. But I knew there would be analyzing the thought, but I know you've been on an airplane. Am I just, is that correct? I was really correct. All right. So I knew there was something going on there. It's important because we sold to the highest in quality people across the country, country clubs, the Westons, everything. So um, fast forward to like the 1950s and they were going to open up. Uh, he was working for a grocery store that was going to get rid of their fish business. And he went to someone that he knows has a lot of money and says, I really know how to sell fish. And they said, we'll invest in you. It was a Clark family. But they said, no one knows Clark, so we're going to call it Charter Fisheries. Yeah, I don't like the Clark seafood doesn't sound good. No. Charter seafood on the other hand. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Do you am I right? Definitely. Charter seafood sounds better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Double, but you know what else works? Turner Network. That's good too. <laughs> and Turner Construction. And Turner Network. Uh, the auction for blowing dead and see it from the island. And then the Clark, Clark, Dredge. Yes, they have the Clark. Yeah. I agree. So fast forward a little bit more. 
And um, the fishing industry got very, very challenged in the late 70s and 80s with regulations, et cetera. So the Clark family sold their interest to someone that was not aligned with the Turner family quality. So we created a much smaller boutique business up in Gloucester, Massachusetts called Turner Seafood. Well, right. to use a different name. And so it was about, um, I, we got married in 1991. I met my husband at Harvard. He was a hockey player. Oh, nice. I was in finance. I was in law. I was perfectly happy with my world. And he ran the fish business. And he came to me one day and says, Kathy, my dad loves to cut fish. He loves being on the floor. And I don't know how we're going to stay in business. And I said, well, everyone wants what you have. You just need to become your own best customer. Right. And so 30 years later, here we are, our own best customers. But we do sell to other restaurants still. So you were a prosecutor, though. I was. Were you prosecuting fishmongers? <laughs> you know, I used my maiden name when I was doing that, which was Mayno, because I did work with the Division of Rape. Oh, you see, the yes. Timmy, the truth is coming out. You did have a Tartar, old Gabby Tartar. She was prosecuting <laughs> Catching too many, too much swordfish or something. No, no. Actually, it was scraping eggs off of lobsters. Those were some, or, or catching elvers. I mean, they weren't, they weren't supposed to do it. Yeah. With food, you know, just play fair. Just yep, play yeah, fair. Yeah, clarify the rules. So. Awesome. Great story. <laughs> Kathy, I, I don't know. I think you know, but in addition to uh, our investment businesses, which are very active in the technology space, certainly uh, we enjoy uh, very much having this podcast and getting to come up to events uh, and appreciate our friends from R365 having us up here and then getting to meet and spend some time of people like yourself. We also actually do own and operate restaurants. And that was kind of the genesis of our even launching our investment platform, which to your, as you said to your, your husband, be your own best customer. We observed that as restaurant operators, we thought a lot of the technology being pushed upon us really was not leveraging or thinking about the needs and really what's critical for operators. So since we couldn't ultimately um, change their ways, we launched a business to then invest in tech companies that ultimately we're bringing what we thought were the most pressing and important solutions uh, for our operator business. Um, but we know, and we're an independent group, um, we're an SMB, a really independent group. Um, we know it's really hard to effectuate um, a meaningful tech stack as a small operator, but that's always what we strive to do. And I think that's what you're doing. So I'd love to, you know, something, you know, you're playing in a space that, that despite being dominated often by the enterprise players, you actually are leveraging technology. And you, I think you identified the needs versus the nice, the needs to have versus the nice. I would love to hear your thoughts on how are you leveraging tech for your business? So we opened our second location. Our first location was 1994 in Melrose. We opened a little fish store in 2006 and our second location in Salem in 2013. And I was That's at, the witches. They are. are right. And okay. our building is haunted. And I it, knew it. Yes, Steve, Jimmy, I knew it. Salem's got witches. Yes. Everyone knows. It's it. But they're nice witches. Uh, nice witches. I don't know. Nice. They're nice. Oh, no, 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 they're totally nice. They're yeah, nice. Oh, yeah. She was a tavern owner. But she was the first one we killed in the Salem witch trial. So our building's on her property, Bridge yeah. of Bishop. Okay. That's awesome. Also, where Alexander Graham Bell sent the first public display of the phone call. Watson, I presume? I love it. Well, I Yes. Yeah. So got these drums of all. I mean, we're hitting them in the head. This is unbelievable. I just want to all pay attention. Take out the notepad. Yeah. I just you. This is serious stuff here. Great trip. Let's get back to the important thing of a tech stack. In 2013, I'm not going to say what I was using for our accounting system, but it was archaic and I could not believe. Wait, were you using this thing, Jimmy? What's that thing called? The slide rule. <laughs> and and the abacus? Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that when you were using? Uh, uh, I had that when it came in, you had to slide the thing around. Well, I'll, I'll say that each company had to be run separately and they couldn't talk to each other. Right. So let me just put it that way. And we have a wholesale company. So we buy the fish right off the dock, take it, process it, distribute it. And so we are a commissary. So I and to my husband, I cannot chase stuffed clams one more day because we sell the ingredients of the stuffed clams. They'd be made here. They go here. We do it here. And it was making me a crazy lady. So I started really looking at what our tech stack was because time is money. Yes. And um, it took us a very long time. So it was not technology in 2013. Not a lot. So archaic. No, yeah. I think so many say guests or folks that are on it in the industry I don't think they appreciate how analog and antiquated we as an industry have been. And now, um, and, and again, you're on the forefront of this, but in 2013, 
we did we have iPhones already by then? I mean, all this now we're talking about the antiquated system, our accounting system of something so important and it didn't exist. Well, the restaurant industry hadn't really changed for almost 150 years. That's you know, many people were still just using pen and paper and you have your little oh, kitchen that. Of course, the two trunk paper now. Yeah. So we started looking then and it actually took us we we first looked at toast in about 2016. Mm-hmm. We actually didn't pull the trigger. Well, that's a Boston company, so you probably got some exposure to that. We did. Right and now. and we actually were very close with the, the Toast people. And um, it was through Toast that we found their partnership with um, R365. Oh, and oh, look at that. Yeah. And I will tell you, I love Restaurant 365. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and still get tears in my eyes when I look at my balance sheet all on one page with all my companies together. <laughs> if you have another child, will your child be named Restaurant 365? <laughs> Rest or no? That's what we are. Maybe just Morgan. A thing in order. That I must, which sounds like a hot I have to say, here's the caption for this. Uh, it, again, it was at the start of this episode with Kathy, but I got to tell you, I already see the caption. Wakes up, teary eyed, thinking about her love of R365. Is there a better testimonial uh, or somebody of that truly passionate and, and sincere? Well, three a.m. I'm a free kid. We love you. Country with that comment. Oh, God. Come on, come on. <laughs> well, for an operator of our size with commissaries, with stores, all these other things, it's just very complicated. Perfect. Yeah, I, well, I didn't think we were complicated until we started trying to figure out how to amalgamate everything into one. And we just have a wholesale business and then we have a retail business. That's complicated. Yeah, and we move product to right. uh, The one thing we want to make sure is the fish are getting this fresh. And so if we have extra stored fish in Melrose, we're getting it to sale them that night. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not going to leave it sitting there. So our rotation is incredibly important. Yeah, no doubt. Listen, it's it's it's, it's a great story. You're an early adopter of Toast Point of Sale, which I think does a terrific job. Uh, they integrate beautifully with Restaurant 365. So that's great that uh, that you found that work. Let's just change gears just a little bit and talk a little bit more about tipping because this is an interesting subject. Jimmy and I talk about it all the time. You know, tipping is one of those things that's very unique to America. I mean, you go anywhere in the world, and and for the most part, it it, it just doesn't. It's not part of the culture. Uh, I just got back from from Spain. I was in Madrid, and I couldn't tell you. It really it it, it took for me. It was very seamless. You would eat, and they would come over with a little handheld. You tap, and you're done. And there was you know, and there's some cities that add. If I know Miami, there's the gratuities included, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, well, what I wanted to get to was that there's an interesting relationship with with regards to the front as the back of the house. Most places, certainly New York. You, you can't share tips with your tip employee, you non tip employees, and you can't share tips with the light folks in the dishwasher, some of the folks that are you're really putting the food out there and and and, and really working hard. It's the playhouse that 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 gets the tips. Now you guys have done something very interesting over here. You're really sharing the wealth. So you are now you have basically said that um, you are adding a one percent fee or one percent administrator or one percent back on how the appreciation to you whatever. Else. You're not like it's, but you're you're or you're saying, look, we're taking one percent of this check, and we're gonna we're gonna whack it up with our with our back of the house team in some in some way. Uh, I think that's really really uh, admirable, and I think that how is that working out for you? Are your customers appreciating that, or the, I mean, I imagine the staff obviously appreciates that. Are you getting backlash? Are people like I'm not doing that, or how does that work? I think a lot of it has to do with how much and how well you disclose it. Mm-hmm. Once you explain to people that in Massachusetts it's also illegal mm-hmm. for the front to CIA the duty with the back of the house, mm-hmm. and we tell people we totally expect you to take this one penny on a dollar and include it in what you might choose to use as a gratuity. And with this penny on a dollar, it actually allows us to spread their dining dollars more equitably against our whole team that's committed to their experience, as opposed to raising menu prices. Because if you raise menu prices, only people get a raise of the servers because the average check goes out. And there's money can ne- it almost never gets to the back. But it also engages the back of the house in the revenue success of the business. And it really engages them. Um, interest. Yes. Making the food great, making sure people are coming back. It's yeah, I, it makes a lot of sense. It's just that it seems like I know Danny Meyer tried, uh, you know, obviously super famous restaurant tour from New York. Danny Meyer, uh, Union Square Hospitality fame. Uh, he tried a few years back to uh, to bring in the no tipping, and 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 I guess he raised menu price and then and raised everyone's wages, and it it it, it didn't fail for lack of trying. Just because customers didn't understand or like it, they just they, they thought that no. 
I'm not tipping. Maybe the staff doesn't make any money. They're not, obviously, they're not getting paid properly. Like, it just it doesn't, it's, it's a very hard not to crack. So I think even more so, we've pulled for 30 years. Mm-hmm. So we have always met that every single guest is every single server. Right. But the servers are always the highest paid people in the building. Yeah. And right now, there is a valid initiative to take away the tip credit. So because we pay our servers 675, there's a there's a union group from California trying to raise that. That's another issue, though. That's so, a different issue. But, but what they have found is every place that's happened, the servers' average hourly wages go down. I want to push it Yeah, I think DC did it. And so this, if you talk about making prices blow up, I mean, you're going to be paying. Yeah. Well, and what you're also in the district a lot of those really good servers out of the industry. Yes. Is that not going to work to $25 an hour when they were used to getting or even yeah. five forty yeah. an hour? A hundred percent. Yeah, not and, working. And you'll just change the model. Now, restaurateurs are very, very smart people and they will figure out how to make it work. What it will change is the dining experience of customers. Yes. Um, so, and it'll also change. So we're, we're really working hard against that for our servers. Because they didn't ask anyone to come in and mess with their chips. And if you know, the industry as a whole seems we don't do a very good job of, of, of explaining it, maybe, uh, to, to the general public of what's going to happen and what's happening, that, that the staff is working there, they, they seem to be making a, a good wage, a fair wage. I always think it's interesting when folks come in and they say that it's not fair that someone working at an entry level position. Um, at a fast food restaurant is, uh, well, how can we support a family of, uh, of five? And I know an entry-level position in quick service, I, I think it was an entry-level position. It's your first job. It may be your first time at high school, your first job at college, your first time in college. It's the first job to, for whatever, to just learn how to work, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was never meant to be a Jimmy, his wife, and three kids, and have two houses and, and, and three dogs. And, and it, that wasn't what it was for. Uh, so it's, it's it's interesting. Well, and it's also the flexibility that the hospitality industry offers. So so that you can schedule your own things. You have the ability to work when you can work and not. And you're absolutely right. Those are entry level jobs for a reason. The restaurant industry is the most competitive industry on the planet. We will self at our our customers walk with their feet and their dollars. If it's not working and our labor works, it, or on the restaurant is pay, pay their labor well. But I wanted to really take my guest dining dollar and spread them more equitably amongst our team without raising my menu prices and without charging them more to dine out. So that's why we, we it's it's one per, it's one penny at the two Turner's locations. It's two pennies at our Rising Eagle Public House. But that's a different service model because the back end house is actively even more actively involved in the service. Yeah, no, Kathy, I couldn't agree more. It's really it's an it's, 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 it's topic. You know, I talk about it all the time. It really is. It's getting me most, you know, it's very out of work. And learning Anderson. And I spend a lot of time now um, speaking with other other operators. Um, and one of the common themes they talk about, I think you just articulated really well. You need to take care of your whole team. And some of these, I think, I'll assume they're best intentioned. Some of these regulations and rules and laws and otherwise are somewhat holding, you know, time when you're behind your back and how you can do that in the back. And that was critical. We talk about it all the time. Listen, I want to maybe not shift gears so much, but I, I, one of the things I love about the hospitality industry, I, I talk about the following, which is how unique an issue it is where the manufacturing facility, that's the back of house and the kitchen, and everything that the guest really doesn't see, is in the same room essentially as the retail facility which is essentially the dining facility. I mean, very unique industry where a guest or a customer gets to be in one of the facility what's being manufactured is also being sold to them and they experience it on premise, on site. But meanwhile, you guys have added two different functions. You're also a manufacturer. You're a, so you're, you're a, you're a supplier. You're a distributor. I mean, you guys have bungled so much. In addition to creating the food, in addition to selling the food, you supply and distribute. What can we do? Yes. So I'm in serious. So supermarket, every idle tree. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, it's idle for the same notes. But that is, that's, that's fairly easy. So I'd love for you to share with our listeners, you know, how do you manage all these arts of your business? Restaurant 365. Can I come in and I'm not kidding. It's not. We're all those back on 365. <laughs> well, no, in all honesty, it does because um, with the commissary and with, with all the different locations, having all of our accounting in one place is absolutely essential. And time is money. 
And all the time that I was trying to take to make sure that everyone was getting their food costs right because we were moving product was just wasting money. So I, I was saying, you know, our vertical integration is from the doctor plate because we actually like to buy off the unloaders because they will start to quality for us. Right. I like giving a shout out to Gaffey. I'm already, I already said a lot of the dog on the fork. Sorry. Yeah. On the fork, off the plate. Off the plate. That's coming. That's not because of the a long way, Jim. That's something that we can get on. I'm getting up trade worry. I'm getting at you. You should do that here. Kathy Cable died. Well, and I have to pay money house to be credited because she can't take line anything pressure so splits. I mean, the crowd loves that. The crowd loves that. Why, please? I gotta get that inside the wind. They love it. They love it. They love it. Well, and we also have fish markets at our other locations. So, which that's super cool. So, yeah, to break the yell and then you can go, yeah, I'd like to get some salmon for tomorrow night. I love it. I love it. I mean, the best thing about the seafood restaurant that fish market is I never walked in and smelled fish. You know what? It's, it's high quality. It's a great high yeah. gallon. I like it. It's just a small. It's a little fishy. It's a little stuff. Unless the... You want to say it's a little fishy. You see this. Do you think it's not an SCC violation? There's no FTT shimmering. Please, please, please. Hey, do you need to? Oh, no. It's okay. It's good. Keep the classy San Diego. Okay. Right. This whole shit that we're talking about. We... Shad's and I clearly have a little banter. We've known each other for a year or two or 37. I always lose count. I love you. Anyway, anyway, um... But we found, you know, all these podcasts, sometime your guest has a question or two for us. So, Kathy, I'm going to let you take the mic. I like to say nothing's off the table. Um, I got to close yours, Kathy. What was the worst concept you opened? Oh, that's awesome. You know, I'd have them. I'd all shats. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you know, and I've done it with you. I, I, I and mean, we've seen it worse. It's like, you know, sometimes, like, I think going in, like, like, I've always felt like they look good. The food was good. It just sometimes it's like, you know, like location, location. Sometimes I thought it was a good idea, thought it was a good concept. Or get better. I just remember, like, it just, I think sometimes it's not so much it was a bad concept. I, like, sorry, I hear it step back. Like, like sometimes it's just, it, it wears out its welcome. You know what I mean? Sometimes it just, it runs its its course of time. You know what I mean? It just, it, it, it you know, because, like twenty five years in a restaurant, that's like, like that, that's like many, many lifetimes. I don't think people understand that. Like, like, and a lot of times restaurants are are are, are, are really it's really it's the lease based, so it's really it's it's you, you sign a ten or twelve or fifteen year lease to pay on the market. We're in like a twelve or fifteen year lease, and and, and once that lease is up, you know inevitably you have to sign another lease, and and inevitably those still get a lot more money. You know where it is. So I think it's not so much that we I mean, we openly they closed. Many restaurants over time. But it wasn't, I don't know that they were really, there were a handful that were probably not as good as they could be. But so I would answer it is that um, I would think that it's really somebody's just leases just expire. That the only just came up with the economics work. I think about uh, Danny Meyer lost his leases. His first flash of meetings were at FA and it was on 16th Street. And and, and it was a great run there. But he knew the economics race when a new landlord came and told the rent was going to be so much history. He knew that it was an impossibility based on what the Randall days were. It wasn't that he didn't want to do it. It's just, I mean, it's only, I don't know, spot. You know? So I think that's something that is what, what happens. If that makes sense, or is it the the answer? Not really answer. I did the one with the honest. I don't, 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 I don't think they wanted to, uh, oh, that's one thing I want to be just, you know, any tricks for one. I'll play. Uh, I'm going to play. I'm going to play. And by the way, let the record show up. I love the day. I love the concept. But the other day, I'm playing it, and the numbers were the numbers. So, Big Daddy's not there. And we had, we had these in Burt South, there in Moss. Uh, this cool neighborhood, open rate, and yet, because I like this, like a, a cool, kitschy 80s, 70s, 80s diner, and people loved it. They came in 24 hours a day. Um, had some drinks, had some fruit, and it was awesome. We opened the Upper East Side. And without relegate, well, we became the Chuck E. G's at the Upper East Side. Well, yeah. we want the Chuck E. Yeah. G's in the Upper East Side. Kids, they'll drink. No. And, and then they can hit us, and they are nice. Parents with your kids at a diner, at a kitchen diner, they said, well, I'm not going to drink. You know what? It's just dinner, they share dishes. They, and we made these big, delicious, blue plate special, big waffles, big pancakes. You know what kids do with that? They share them. All of a sudden, we got liquor sales and like less than 1%. Yeah. And we were idling about like six people in a day and one had three meals. 
We got to do sharing and everything. So eventually we had to turn it to kids, which is our original roadhouse, our sports bar, and, and it took people drinking, they, they eat, they get firing, we get much better. But uh, to Shad's point, that location and that concept, we thought it was this cool diner uptown. It became the not hot and chuck and cheese. I mean, you got the bar, she left out the cheese. Uh, uh, you're right, Jim. But that was that was the, the, the liquor, the shelling, the cost basis, and going to New York is too expensive. Them an average, you know, at the time, an average check price of thirteen bucks a person. Yeah. Oh, good for a top one. Yes, yeah, there, there you go. All right, all right. Well, listen, with a great question, by the way. Let's just jump into. Let's jump into our our, our new segment: the food serves you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay, because it's two day trivia edition. and we've asked over one hundred million people. I've only been last week, okay? A hundred million people. Everyone wants the Super Bowl. Everyone wants the Super Bowl. Answer this question. Answer that this question, okay? Yes. Now, the you your imaginary buzzer red. All right. You need to eat buzzer red. I'm ready. I'm going to ask you what we asked a hundred million people. And uh, the top answer is on the board, okay? And we're going to get the right answer. I'm going to give you a uh, choice. All right? I'm going to give you a choice. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Good ready. You're ready. I'm ready. All right. What is the most widely eaten food worldwide? Is it bread, rice, cereal, or soup? Mm-hmm. Jimbo. Yeah. Bread. Yeah. Right. See, I'm going with rice. That's right. Wait, wait, wait. Kathy? Hang on a second. I got to give Jimmy uh, a zinger. Can you get it? I got to give Jimmy. I got you. That's, 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 that's bad. That's bad. Sandy because all the burgers, all the pizza, Jaffe, you could steal and win in fabulous prizes. Right. Ding, 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 Jaffe, Jarno, famous Tyler C. Feeney wins it all. What fabulous prizes can you add? I went got cards, you got trips in the Bahamas, you got all sorts of incredible things, gift cards, anything you want. We have to chose the archery since you have yet a month. You know, can you send me a pass? We just can you credit out the car? If you want to see my mom, what is it? Yeah, first, you are pre 65. Why is a staple food in the world? Half the world population. And it's been that great for centuries, Jim. It's cheap, it's the only ad to be easily grown in a variety of primates. Why is the support? It's so many people. It's no surprise. That's the world's most eaten food. And that will tip it. I don't know what you know. I don't know what you if you need that fun, industry facts as much as we do, you should check out the newly released R365 2024. The rest of our fees to report, you can download the set report for my paying facts at fb 365com Let's bring it to our 635.com. The report was very expensive. How much is that? Jill is absolutely free now. Definitely $20 for you. Resources tab will also, by the way, Jimmy will add, yes, Jimmy will add, Mendel will run facts about food all around the world. Yes. So make sure you jump into that, and I love it. So that's restaurant365.com for their sale restaurant. It is your report. Let's go jumping into the Mendel with five days. He's got CD Bowl, the Polo Wall Oats, and he's bringing it to the market right now. So we got very, very quick at the five light like, internet questions. Are you ready? Yes. I'm thinking too hard. Never let me shine. A failure resting up chin started in a ball. Is it a simple seafood meal? Medical or pizzeria and roll? It's used for a pop of the GM. Or turn with seafood restaurant. No, you can't. But it's kind of safe to. I don't know. It's kind of safe to. It's good. It's only an analogy on it. Maybe you're not sure. It's a change. This is your section. It's eight or two inch for a cent. Is it sheer? So the bringing a two inch witch. Alan and Neil or the practice. And it's having on this. It's chairs. Oh. Yeah. And I'm so pretty one loud. Yes. Finger Boston born silver. Is it Marky Mark, Calvin Klein Waller, Lee Thurman, Eddie Orton, Barbara Walla Walters, or Colin O'Brien? Benjamin Ferry Klein. The hell would Ben go to go on? It's going to right in your head. Love it. I love it. Was Ben going in Boston? It was. It was one of the balls. Yes. I had more. Well, I, yeah, we're going to ask you ask her. Get down. I got to tell you. All right, here we go. Is it the Let's Talk? Is it the Celtics? Is it the Bruins or the Patriots? It's the Red Sox. Red Sox. All right, so here's where your things a little dicey. If you were challenged, Chip Ryan, to compete for the best time in the world famous Boston Marathon, who would you have better odds of beating? And by the way, it is a full marathon. This is the Boston Marathon, and it's marathon only. Who are you going to beat, Jimmy or I? Who would have better odds of beating? Better odds of beating. These are odds of beating. Jimmy or I? Jimmy. 
You have three Jimmy? Yeah. All right, Jimbo. You, you got a little bit of information. Yeah. Wow, I got, I got it. Exactly. I wanted up here. One of you all lost because you had some of uh, running around. That was me. Although, it was a few years ago, and uh, it was a few uh, weeks before I had it. Yeah. And swapping in Greeks became flesh. All of them, but that's good. Well, I was a runner in college. There we go. All right. By the way, I don't run marathons anymore. Clearly. Yeah. Well, it's like watching, especially if you go to a bar, I love this cup of chowder. And I uh, enjoyed Samuel Adams, Kathy Turner, royalty in Boston, clean down. I got to tell you, we are lucky to have met you today. You're at, what are we doing? RTT, Jimbo? RTT, 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 restaurant transfer. Listen to our Kathy Royal listeners. If we want to check out Turner Seafood, what's our URLs? TurnerSeafood.com? TurnerSeafood.com. TurnerSeafood.com. That's right. Turner's hyphen seafood.com check it out they're bringing in flesh fish every day they're making clam chowder of a great grandfather invented clam chowder so it's obviously great and you can buy fish you can eat you can enjoy it you can marry it's the best so check it all out my kathy thank you this was awesome yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. really fun to meet you for the time thank you kathy <laughs>